Okay, this is section three of the Vietnam War. Uh, today we're going to look at um, kind of some some differences in opinion about the war in Vietnam. Um, we'll talk about the draft a little bit and uh, just some, some more escalation of the war. By 65, most of the troops being sent to Vietnam no longer were men who had volunteered or were enlisted uh, in the armed forces, but instead were were drafted. In accordance with the Selective Service Act of 1948, the government drafted more than 1.5 million men into military service during the Vietnam War. All males had to, still have to, register for the draft within 30 days of their 18th birthday. Um, the Selective Service System called up draftees based on projected military needs. So just because you were called up doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be sent to war. Um, you know, so we did not send that entire 1.5 million. Uh, it just means they were being prepared at camps, different things like that. Critics of the draft argued the Selective Service system was not fair because it gave local draft boards <clears throat> considerable influence when they chose which men were going uh, were going to be um, selected for service and granted deferments to college students and men who worked in certain occupations. So if you were, you know, worried about getting drafted, you got you could defer. Uh, you know, if you were in school working towards a degree, if you were in a in an occupation that was considered you know, of, of dire need, uh, would be the way I would word it. So, um, you know, if you're a surgeon and you're drafted, you probably are going to be deferred. Uh, you're not going to have to do that. Um, you know, if you're a mechanic and, and you are selected, probably not going to be able to get a deferment because of your occupation. Most of the 2.5 million uh, men who served in Vietnam came from working class and poor backgrounds. Uh, the chart on the right side of the screen, um, we'll talk about some more on the next slide, but this is African Americans uh, when it comes to the Vietnam War. So the red line, that's African American combat deaths for the United States Army. Um, and then the blue line is the African American population in the United States. During President Johnson's uh, administration, the number of African Americans fighting and dying in Vietnam was disproportionately high, as I showed you on the previous slide on that chart. Um, African Americans were more likely to serve in combat positions uh, as opposed to being a commissioned officer. So they were more likely to be in dangerous situations. Uh, on average than their white counterparts. Civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., spoke out against the unequal burden that Vietnam was placing on the shoulders of minorities and of the lower socioeconomic classes. Perceived inequities in the draft led to widespread resistance. Anti-war advocates sponsored to stop the draft week, uh, where some draft-eligible men burned their draft cards, um, which I have a picture of men burning the draft cards above. Uh, that is not at the 67 Stop the Draft Week. It's just a different picture from 1969 of, of protesters burning their draft cards. Finally, in 1969, the Selective Service System adopted a lottery that was designed to eliminate deferment abuses and create a more diverse, uh, diverse army of draftees. College campuses across the United States became centers of uh, anti-war sentiment with students and professors both criticizing the war for a multitude of reasons, ranging from how it was impacting uh, the United States at home, how it was impacting society uh, as, as a whole for the you know worldwide society, uh, for political reasons, uh, the economic impact it was having on, on the United States, and then uh, personal and religious beliefs as well. Anti-war uh, sentiment on, on campuses did not represent America's stance on the war as a whole. Uh, many teachers and students remained supportive of the war. Um, 
it wasn't every single student that was in a college that opposed the war, and it wasn't every single professor. Um, but anyway, teach-ins did become prevalent. So we talked about sit-ins during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so it's kind of the same thing here in a series of lectures and discussions about the war uh, leading to more protests. Anti-war activities were part uh, of more significant changes taking place on campuses. College enrollment increased more than 2 million, or excuse me, increased from 2 million to 8 million from 1946 to 1970. Students found themselves or made themselves segregated and away from the rest of society, uh, free from a job, free from their family maybe for the first time. Um, I say free, just away from their family and, and, and kind of free to experience adulthood for the first time maybe or free to have their own opinions and ideas and have other people listen to them maybe for the first time and um, you know I think that to an extent still happens in, in college and, you know many of you want to go to college and you will and, and you'll see like it is definitely your first little dose kind of of reality um, but at the same time, not because you're you're around, you know, everyone that you're around is within four or five years of, of your age. So uh, it is kind of like being in your own little world on a college campus. In addition, for the most part, students were who were wealthier um, were more likely to oppose the war uh, and protest. Middle class students were less likely to speak out negatively about the war. At the University of Michigan and the University of California at Berkeley, uh, they became important hubs for anti-war uh, activities and the anti-war movement. The Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, was founded at the Michigan campus in 1960. SDS was originally founded to combat racism, so that's the very beginning of the Civil Rights Movement when it was founded in 1960, uh, and fight for equal rights, but it soon transitioned to campaigning for an end to the war in Vietnam. Student activism led to a clash with administrators and police in 64. Uh, Berkeley uh, protested the school's decision to not let them use campus grounds to organize off-campus activities. Uh, so students formed the free speech movement pro to protest the decision and occupied a university building, meaning they kind of barricaded themselves inside of it. Police arrested them. Students uh, responded by skipping class uh, to march and support the free speech movement. And there were so many students skipping class that school officials finally relented, allowed them to use the campus to organize uh, for off-campus activities, and that signaled a major victory for college students. Um, other Americans began to enlist in anti-war causes as well, as the Vietnam War was the first quote-unquote living room war, a war that was on television. I, I know I mentioned this in one of the previous sections, um, you know, We've had world wars. We'd have we've had big wars in our in our country's history before, but this was the first one where Americans saw it every single day. Uh, they could turn on you know their television every evening, and the evening news was going to include at some point kind of a, a death count or a death tally, and you know it didn't matter that our numbers were so much lower. The amount of, of communists that were, were dying, it was it didn't matter. It was still a lot of Americans dying. Um, reporters, like I, I mentioned previously, would go out in the field uh, with different units of, of American soldiers, um, sometimes really putting themselves in harm's way to do that. Uh, but it was the first time Americans could, could see full coverage of a war um, and the progress or lack thereof. Uh, because we kind of talked about this before, there's no route to victory um, in Vietnam like there had been in World War II. There's no, you know, quote-unquote Berlin that we need to get to to end this thing. Hawks and dust drifted further apart, and more people organized against the war. Soon a credibility gap arose. We uh, kind of talked about our generation gap when we were going through some different cultural stuff in the 50s and 60s. The credibility gap... It's kind of similar, um, as Americans were hearing optimistic answers from politicians and the exact opposite from reporters and news correspondents. I think you could definitely make the argument that this is still very much the case today, depending on um, 
what you're watching and where you're getting your news. Uh, you know, I say that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, that, that's the case still. Like, you'll hear a politician say one thing, and if you watch a certain news network, they'll claim that, that they are not doing that thing, and if you watch another news network, they'll be fully behind that politician. So it's, it's uh, definitely still a gap today, maybe even argue a wider gap between what's actually happening and what uh, is being reported. On January 21st, 1968, this is the Tet Offensive. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this some more. I've got some uh, video to show you on this. The North Vietnamese hit Khe Sanh in northwest South uh, Vietnam. Nine days after that, the communists expanded their attack by hitting key United States and Arvin positions throughout the South. The Tet Offensive, as it came to be known, was a coordinated assault on 36 provincial capitals in five major cities, as well as the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. So the map on the right side of the screen, um, all the blue dots, those are all targets that were coordinated to happen at the same time. They were assaulted at the same time um, as a part of the Tet Offensive. The communists planned to take and hold the cities until... The urban population, so the people that lived in the cities, took up arms themselves to fight with them, believed this would end the war and get the United States out of there. The fighting was fierce, but eventually the United States and Arvin troops um, were able to push the offensive and the communists back. This is a tactical victory for the United States, but it didn't seem like it. Uh, it really just showed the communists, you know, no matter how many times we bombed them, had not lost their fight. After Tet, American military, military leaders seemed less confident of a quick end to the war. When Westmoreland requested more troops, Johnson asked his new Secretary of Defense, uh, because at this time McNamara has stepped down, uh, Clark Clifford, to take an objective look at, military, at the military situation and political situation in Vietnam. Clifford knew if he sent more troops, it would require raising taxes, increasing the draft, uh, calling up reserves, causing more casualties, uh, more dissent. Um, those casualties are going to include deaths. They're going to include pretty horrific injuries as well. And, and we still might not win. Clifford came to the conclusion the United States shifted its policy to one from absolute victory to one of negotiated peace. That's going to be important later. While many Americans made it more and more uh, clear that, of their disapproval of the war, both Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, if you don't remember, um, had been uh, 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 the Attorney General um, under his brother, John F. Kennedy. Uh, they both decided to announce they were going to run uh, as Democrats in the upcoming election for president. So Johnson made the decision that he was not going to run for re-election. Uh, he announced this in a televised address March 31st, 1968, two months after the Tet Offensive. He also announced the United States would limit its bombing of North Vietnam and try to find a way to, to get a peace settlement negotiated in this war. Johnson desperately wanted to end the war before his presidency was up. Um, fortunately, that does not happen. Um, but it was a turning point in what we were attempting to do to get out of Vietnam. And then we're back in 68. We kind of talked about this in some other sections of notes. 68 is a pretty horrific year uh, in terms of people we lose. April 4th, Martin Luther King is assassinated on his hotel balcony in Memphis. Uh, June 5th, 1968, Robert Kennedy, who's a Democratic candidate for president, um, is shot and killed. Uh, in a hotel kitchen um, by a Palestinian immigrant, Sir Abraham. We'll talk about that uh, a little more. I've got some uh, a video kind of regarding those things as well. The murders of King and Kennedy cast a dark shadow over the election campaigns, obviously. Um, August 1968, the Democrats convened in Chicago to choose a candidate. So this is the Democratic National Convention. Anti-war protesters arrived inside of the convention, Chicago police and members of the National Guard were deployed to try to prevent outbreaks of violence 
inside, Hubert Humphrey uh, is chosen over McCarthy to be the, the Democratic candidate for president. Um, outside of the convention, uh, out on the street, violence between protesters and the police broke out. Um, the police uh, beat back the protesters with nightsticks, and protesters started to throw rocks and bottles, so there it was not a pretty sight. And the cameras covering, they were supposed to be covering the Democratic National Convention, who the candidate was going to be. Um, <laughs> really, we're talking more about the, the rioting outside than they were um, Hubert Humphrey. In Miami, uh, Florida, it was a much more peaceful convention where the Republican National Convention took place and they nominated Richard Nixon to, to be the Republican candidate for president and he promised to deliver, quote, peace with honor if he was elected. He wanted to get the United States on, but he wanted to do it, he said, with their honor intact. He also promised to listen, and this is one of the greatest <laughs> campaign moves um, in, in U.S. history. It's it's quite a uh, it's quite a tactic. I'll kind of talk some more about it. Promise to listen to the quote, "Great forgotten, quiet, silent majority." Uh, the non-shouters and the non-demonstrators. This group Nixon referred to is nicknamed the Silent Majority. Um, politicians after him will kind of copy this a little bit. Uh, we'll talk more about it in class. Uh, it's a brilliant tactic taken by Nixon. He never really had to prove that there was a majority that he was standing up for, supposedly, because they're by definition silent. And people that weren't quite as engaged in politics um, and, and therefore were not going to be testing anything because they're just, you know, worried about themselves and, and, you know, going to work, going to school, coming home, taking care of things, just kind of, just kind of taking care of themselves. When they did hear, because, I mean, the presidential election is a popular one, that this guy Nixon is going to take care and, and speak up for the non-shouters and the non-demonstrators and the quote-unquote, you know, non-troublemakers, and a lot of Americans would fit that category. They're like, this guy's for me. And he got a lot of votes that way. Uh, especially in the South. The candidates in 1968 were Republican. Richard Nixon, who I was just talking about, uh, Democrat Hubert Humphrey, and Independent George Wallace. We talked about George Wallace during the Civil Rights Movement. He was the governor of Alabama that stood in front of the University of Alabama and didn't want to um, let uh, Vivian Malone and Jimmy Hood uh, integrate that school. And then, of course, he has to get out of the way, and they do desegregate University of Alabama, uh, but that's him, and he's, you know, that's Mr. George Wallace. So Wallace had been a Democrat prior to his election, a Southern Democrat, uh, obviously, but entered to represent Southern voters who were unsettled by the movement away from traditional Southern values, representing the, quote, white backlash on the civil rights movement and desire for victory in Vietnam as opposed to a peace settlement. Uh, so he's you know, more conservative, uh, I would say, than, than Nixon. Uh, Nixon's Southern strategy and Wallace's entry as a third-party candidate took Democratic voters away from Humphrey Nixon's victory, marked a new Republican domination of the American presidency for, for a little while. Nixon wins. Um, here's the, the campaign map, what it looked like. So all the red states... Go to Nixon. The blue states go to uh, Hubert Humphrey. Texas might surprise you, but remember, Hubert Humphrey was Lyndon B. Johnson's vice president, and Lyndon Johnson was from Texas. So that's part of the reason he was able to win Texas. The yellow states are Wallace. So those are all southern states, right? Uh, and he was the governor of Alabama, so that's part of the reason he got those states. All right. That is the end of Section 3 for the Vietnam War. Um, here are your questions that go along with that. We will pick back up with Section 4. And uh, that'll, that's it.